Podcast number one. The topic for today is Game of Thrones, the series on the television and the books. But first we're going to do some introductory stuff and we're going to talk about ourselves just briefly and some of the other things uh, we're going to be discussing on future podcasts. So I'm Morgan and I'm here with my lovely colleague. Is that all that I am to you? Mm -hmm. Is that all this is, has been a professional relationship? An arrangement? Yes. <laughs> on LinkedIn? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yes. I'm his girlfriend. <laughs> My name is Shalini, um, and we're both here to talk about fun stuff. I'm very interested in history. I love history. I love cool events, cool people in history, um, seeing civilizations build up and then decline, like all that, like in all the kind of minutia within like these uh, topics is just fascinating. Um, and he almost named his dog Napoleon. Totally almost happened. <laughs> the dog has a certain weight and epicness to him. I can't really describe and it. And he has the, the short man, like, superiority complex. Yeah. What, what is it called? It, it's a Napoleonic, Napoleonic <laughs> complex. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's a small dog, and he, 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 he likes to tumble around with the big ones. Yeah, he, no, he just, just not even tumble, he just dominates them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because the, the, the little dogs have that thing where, like, they are... Uh, they're more intimidating than the bigger dogs yeah. in the dog world. It's like the inverse of the human world. That might come up when we're talking about like the mountain or something. <laughs> I feel like how <laughs> size plays and then, you know, mountain <laughs> compared to Tyrion and like the weight hmm. of these characters. Interesting. And, yeah. And Varys' quote that, um, oh, I can't remember it completely, but the um, power is like a shadow. It casts um, like... Power is like a shadow in that it, like, it's not your actual size, but the size of your influence or what people perceive you as is what matters, and it's not your actual size. Whoa. So, yeah, he, t he says that to Tyrion. It's deep. Yeah. It's serious. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, can't, I, can't wait to get, I can't wait to actually, like, get talking about mm -hmm. Thrones. So, like, yeah, so we'll just kind of get through the, um, the intro bit. Yes. Uh, so some of the things that we're going to be talking about in the future shows, okay, films and books, because they're both great. Mm -hmm. Unavoidable, like totally not avoidable for us to talk about. Knowing us is Lord of the Rings, <laughs> um, but not just not just the the rings. But we're gonna talk about Silmarillion, Children of Huron. I'm probably just gonna I'm probably gonna do that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't be, read that. Uh, one. The Potters, <laughs> all of them, every single one of them. The movies. Yes. Should we do like one podcast per book slash movie? Oh, God, so I, we have like an eight part series. Yeah. Or there seven part. Yeah. Just be like all pottered out by the end. <laughs> yeah. So those we're going to talk about. We're also going to talk about uh, the films Troy, 300, and Alexander. Because these are three films that are depicting events of the classical antiquity era. And also they have hot people in them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. It's, yeah, I want to pull up like just pictures of like. Lena Headey in uh, Hedy. <laughs> Hedy? Headey? Headey. Yeah. yeah. So I got it right the first time. Yeah. In uh, 300. Oh, damn. And Brad Pitt. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. Brad Lots Pitt's of hot. Like just this, like the the most attractive people playing like these heroes of uh, of the old yeah. world. So my area of forte is English lit, and that's also why we're also going to talk about books and other texts yeah. that you can interpret. Yeah. Um, we're also going to talk about philosophers and philosophy and the psychology of philosophy. So we've kind of talked about like the similarities between like the big philosophers and stuff and how their like childhood and stuff might have affected them. So we'll get into that later when we actually get into those podcasts. Um, what else? We can talk about, well, I've been doing a, a research project with um, uh, an academic publication on monster studies. So we might delve into that that might be more like interspersed into everything like game of thrones it could probably pop up and all the other sort of fantasy texts and stuff so that might be a, an interesting thread to look at uh, uh but yeah that's about it more to come yeah more to come so to get into game of thrones so i've got some questions shalini is the resident game of thrones expert in this duo 
Yes. <laughs> So talk a little bit about how you became acquainted with the series. Um, so I was about in 10th grade, I think, and my brothers were reading this book and they were like, oh, hey, this is like a really good fantasy book because they knew I was like really into that kind of genre um, with like Harry Potter. And I'm also a creative writer in that field. So I was like, oh, cool, I'll try and read it. And then um, they told me that it was... Uh, going to become a book or like a, a TV show soon. I was like, oh, that's really cool. So I wanted to read the books before I, at least the first one, before I, I saw the TV show. And then they were like, oh, it's it's a bit racy. I don't know if we'll let you watch the TV show. And I was like, well, bitch, try and stop me. Anyway, so I, <laughs> I read the book. I mean, like, you can't just give a book to someone and be like, yeah, you can't watch the show. Anyway, so I read the book and I was like really into it. And yeah, I just read all five of them after that, basically, whenever I could get my hands on them. And I'm reading, rereading them currently. I'm on the first one still, but yeah. So okay, so to get, so that's how you kind of uh, came to be acquainted with the series. For me, mm-hmm. um, you actually got me into it. Yes. I remember because I mean, it came out in 2011, and at the time I, I had heard of it, I didn't really know, and I was still I was a bit younger at the time. Obvi- I mean, obviously. <laughs> But, like, I, I mean, like, I was um, a teenager, I think. Uh, no, yeah, definitely was a teenager. But in terms of genre, like, it was pretty close, like, to things that I like. I mean, we just brought up The Lord of the Rings, and I know people who object to kind of grouping Game of Thrones and Lord of the Rings together, but, mm-hmm. I mean, George R.R. R. Martin and Tolkien are just so, like, similar when you... Yeah. And break things down. And like Martin has said that he's gained in, it's inspiration from Tolkien, not just for. Oh, it's undeniable. Yeah. Like, you no, know, he doesn't deny it at all. He's like Tolkien is like the forefather of modern fantasy, but Martin has also like said that he like his inspiration also comes from uh, deviating from Tolkien, so not having the same sort of tropes and stuff. Martin is all about breaking tropes, and that's something we'll talk about relating to the show as well. Which might not be doing the same thing as Martin is doing. But anyway. Yes. Keep going with your... So my next question for you. (laughs) In this interrogation. (laughs) Is uh, what do you think about the way the show renders the dragons. Mm -hmm. Which are of course like an extremely important part of the plot. And the general fantastical aspect of of Mm -hmm. a television show. Mm -hmm. Well on a like purely visual and physical level I think they do a like mostly amazing job with it um I've heard some complaints recently about like how they're they're always supposed to be like awe-inspiring and inspirational and it's kind of like losing its luster I still think it's it's more for the characters in the show where Obviously, some of them are seeing them for the first time, so we're supposed to be immersed in their experience. So, for example, in the latest uh, finale, in the dragon pit, Daddy comes down with the dragon, and it's, like, with inspirational music, and, like, it's almost as if we've never seen dragons before. But we're supposed to see it through, like, Cersei's eyes and Jamie's eyes and um, Bronze eyes. Like, oh, no, Bronze not there because he's gone to get a drink with Pod. But anyway, so everyone who hasn't seen it yet, we're supposed to see it through their eyes. If you're analyzing it from like a a monster studies perspective, which only came around uh, during the 1990s, um, if you think about where evil or monstrosity comes from, like back in the day, it used to be something external. Um, So like the devil is not, like at first may not be inside you, it's like devil is a person and all that kind of stuff. So there is a very, like, binary of what's good and what's evil, but now, like, nuclear weapons are created by people, right? It's not just, like, a it's something that just pops out of nowhere. So it's integral to humanity that there's some sort of monstrosity that we can bring out to the world. So dragons kind of, I guess, represent that, and, like, metaphorically that we've created uh, nuclear weapons and dragons represent them. Well, I mean, everyone loves dragons because any mm-hmm. kid who also liked dinosaurs growing yeah. up like I did, I mean, dragons are, yeah. they're that plus <laughs> wings and, and fire. fire. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, the um, seeing the Hobbit films and Benedict Cumberbatch's uh, mm. performances, smog and just like, yeah. oh my God. But anyway, to bring it, to, to not get into 
Tolkien. Let's keep, let's yeah. keep it in Westeros, folks. Yeah. In season seven, yeah. like, that, that episode, uh, about midway through or so. Mm-hmm. Uh, the fire? Yeah, where the, the Lannister caravan train yeah. just gets lit up by, by the yeah. drag. Like, that was just fucking awesome. Yeah, that was insane. Yeah. That was one of the coolest pieces of, yeah. of, of cinematography that I've ever seen mm-hmm. uh, with dragons. Mm-hmm lights up like just like a, gr- a group of soldiers mm-hmm. and they're, like they're burning and then the the force from the wind of the dragon's wings like mm-hmm. when it when it flaps oh, yeah. is they just get swept away like this like they're dust it's yeah. just like oh my god Jeez, it's crazy it's so eerie but like also just like crazy awesome yeah what did you think about the ice dragon because i don't think i've asked you about this like off air <laughs> yeah 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 i don't know or the um, white dragon i guess you could it's say. Uh, like in a way, it, I, I don't really know if it's more or less menacing, really. But mm. I think the fact is, because it's, it's in control uh, of the White Walker yeah. King, yeah. it's like okay, well, you know, he just wants to kill people and yeah. fuck shit up. Yeah. So it's not like Daenerys who uses the dragons in a mostly measured and yeah. calculated way. I guess yeah. you can say. <laughs> um, this is no like the Night King is just a dude who just wants to kill all life so yeah the fact that he's got a dragon version of of him mm-hmm. sort of is uh it's, it's just scary. like insane so speaking of monsters mm-hmm. and white walker dragons <laughs> we're gonna talk about the regular white rockers white rockers white i like rock- it white i rocker. love it i love it white rockers white we're, rockers. we're keeping that <laughs> yeah. so what about them what about them well, I can talk about the book version of White Walkers because they are a little bit different. Um, they're supposed to be like silent, which is something that the TV show um, keeps uh, loyal to. But they're also supposed to be like beautiful creatures um, and not really zombie-like as um, the show kind of portrays them, even though they're like covered in, in like white and ice and they have blue eyes, which is all very similar. But they're they're supposed to be covered in armor that's supposed to like glisten um, as if it's like made of like uh, mother of pearl. Like it's supposed to have different colors to it. They're supposed to be very slim and uh, agile and beautiful, almost like elves in a certain way, mm-hmm. which I thought was a very interesting choice for like yeah, a, an evil just race. Just the description alone. Of yeah, saying. exactly. And they're supposed to carry slim blades and they're very like in tune with the, the icy nature around them. And they're not... They're not inherently menacing. It's only because we see them from a human perspective that they are menacing because they are ultimately there to destroy humanity so far as we know um, and just cover all of Westeros and probably the entirety of Planetos um, in ice and cold. And that's about it. Um, in the books, we're not, we don't know anything about White Walkers, really, like their origins. We, um like, the show goes into much more detail about, like, who they are, even though it's not much at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think I prefer the, the book White Walkers a bit more because they are a bit more eerie. They don't have as much, like, obviously they don't have a perspective in the book, so you don't see them just walking or, like, marching. Um, you don't get little sh- shots of that or little passages on that. Um, but I think they... Well, just judging by George R. R. Martin's sort of um, perspective on writing and world building and stuff, I can't see them to be the absolute evil that the show is kind of portraying them as. Um, I can see them more because, first of all, they are called the others in the show, and also sometimes, in, or sometimes in the show, and mostly in the books, um, and obviously others. If you're thinking in sort of like a literary or like. Um, historical sort of way even like when you say others you're othering that person so you're making that person like an alien or someone who's not welcomed and that's like the sort of that has a racial and um like all sorts of history with that in terms of identity so i martin is all about breaking those tropes so if we view something as the other then for martin he's he's there to like break that and kind of make them not other but something just different so I think the White Walkers are actually there. Um, I've I've heard this uh, opinion online where they're just supposed to be creatures who have heard their own prophecy and they're about humans who are going to destroy the world or something or destroy them and they're just creating a countermeasure to destroy 
the humans before they can destroy them. But, well, yeah. later on, I'm going to ask you, like, what do you think about, like, the outlook of the show? Like, we're going <laughs> to save that yeah. rant for the yeah. For the, yeah. <laughs> well, you brought it up briefly, like, uh, politics, mm-hmm. I guess. This question is about political intrigue. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously, many of the fans of the Thrones show like how the political intrigue of the mm-hmm. program uh, mm-hmm. plays out. Yes. Um, like, it's not just, so it's, it's, you know, it's the drama, it's the conniving and the politics and the complicated relationships and betrayals. Mm-hmm. Like, Martin's clearly, like, been inspired by the political intrigue that existed, you know, like, in Europe during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. Mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. Um, All that history. Yeah. Wars of succession and, you know, these these conflicts among the noble classes and, yeah, and the family. consequences. Yeah, yeah totally. Um, I think the rendering on the show is much cleaner. <laughs> uh, like, the books are, like, I remember reading Clash of Kings and just being like, this is so, like, base and disgusting. Like, I can't even, like, go read through this. It's, like, disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, in the show, you're just like, yay, Tyrion, like, he's so smart. And that's about it. But, like, going into, like, the nitty-gritty of all these people's, like, thoughts and um like their their psyches and like they're seeing their motivations and stuff it's kind of um it's illuminating in the way that humans think but also like the capacities of what they can do and what sort of like horrors they can inflict on other people i think that's that's why it's so fascinating it's yeah it's because it's like uh you you are kind of seeing into the mind of mm-hmm. of the character a yeah. little bit especially in the i mean i uh, i haven't actually read the books mm-hmm. and like you know that mm-hmm. But um, even from just watching the, like the, the programs, like you get the sense that there are some characters in the show that are just like so vile and even more vile than like the actual show kind of makes them out to be. If mm. that makes sense, because mm. like you know, like, like you'll they'll be they'll speak eerily, they'll be eerie kind of like yeah camera shots of them there'll be creepy music like whenever they are kind of like around who are you thinking of here uh well probably ramsey but, oh, like, but i mean yeah. that's i think he's a different case anyway because he's just like a psychopath yeah but i think you know like uh lord baelish is one mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know melisandra yeah there's all sorts of stuff that we don't know about her and who she is she's like a 500 year old crone <laughs> But yeah, um, I mean, especially with Lord Ramsay, he's a totally different character in in the in the books. Like I've talked to Morgan about this, but he's supposed to be like this ugly, like chubby, like creature of a man who has like pink pouty lips and like big bulging eyes, and he's it's not, fucking hot. Yeah, <laughs> he's not like Ewan Rian who plays him in the in the show at all, um, and he he doesn't like killing himself mostly like he he obviously enjoys torturing people but he doesn't like and he hunts uh women in the forest and stuff but he's he's not like all buff and stuff as uh they portray in the show and he's he's not like a a dashing dark boy or whatever um he's just like astutely creepy and and that's the thing like some some things are not renderable to um a, a tv like sort of format Especially when it comes to people's minds, it's very hard to show motivations on TV unless they, like, the people explicitly say, this is why I'm doing this. Um, and that's kind of the issue with the, the seasons recently is that they don't really sit down to explain why they're doing certain things or why they're um, behaving the way they are. And that, I feel like that's kind of uh, been an issue of the show. But, yeah, other than that, like, the political intrigue, especially at the beginning, that's basically the whole reason why it was so um, interesting to so many people, because they had never seen a political drama set in a fantasy sort of um, arena. And also it has, like, very real-world real sort of implications as well, because we're all squabbling about who's the president of the United States, whereas... There's there's climate change happening and all that kind of stuff, which is supposed to be emblematic of White Walkers. Okay, so what did you think about season seven's finale, which I mm-hmm. love, by the way. Mm-hmm. It was a great show. <laughs> I 
I hated it. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> no, it was a great episode. No, I, I really enjoyed it. It's probably one of the best episodes that we've had recently. It's also like an hour and a half long or something. Um, which yeah, is it was long. Awesome. I was like, this is like a fucking movie. It's like movie. a movie, yeah. yeah. I know a lot of people had issues with how slow it kind of got at certain points, but I like that because it kind of just slowed everything down, whereas everything has kind of been going very fast recently. Um, so, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I really liked how everyone just came together in the dragon pit. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, seeing all the r little relationships that they had going on and weaving through that scene was pretty awesome. Um, I think my favorite, like, the one that stands out the most was the ending with, um, no, it wasn't the ending, was it? Was it the, was that the last shot? Like, the White Walkers coming into West yeah. Rose? Okay. Yeah. That yeah. was, okay. Um, yeah, that was, like, the, the White Dragon was, like, my, like, favorite thing because, like, it was so epic, like, the way that they created that scene with the, like, I love the way that the dragon looked. I love the sort of, like, uh, like the whatever energy that it breathed like uh, uh, like people are like arguing like is it fight uh, is it feist <laughs> is it fire is it ice is it feist <laughs> um but yeah, yeah it's I, like a fucking godzilla energy beam like, yeah it's just, it's just like this blue like yeah it's like a laser beam yeah. it's not it doesn't burn the ice it, it kind of it blew yeah it, up. it blew it up like, so <laughs> i've i've heard cool. from um, one of the theorists on YouTube, uh, Ideas of Ice and Fire, and he was talking about how it was, like, the energy that the children of the forest gave to the White Walkers um, when they first turned them, and it's what turns their eyes blue. And that's that's the thing that the dragon is, um, like, spurting out. Because, wow. yeah, and it kind of makes sense, right? Because, like, normal dragons have fire inside their stomachs or whatever. That's what's fueling them. And now when the dragon is dead and it's resurrected, like, this new sort of energy is fueling them. So it kind of makes sense that it's, like, whatever White Walker mojo jojo it is. Yeah. Yeah. I especially, I mean, um, I love that part. Yeah, it looked beautiful um, as well. Yeah, I mean, it's, like, like a visually, like, just a stunning yeah. kind of scene. Um, I want to know if Tormund, like, survived. Yeah. I like, guess that's, uh, that's going to bug me until, until the next season. I have this theory that he's going to come back as a, as a white... And he's oh, gonna fight with Brienne, fuck. and she's gonna be like, "Fuck no! Why not. didn't I protect this dude?" I mean, he nearly died this season, and he's nearly died at least a couple <laughs> times before. Yeah. So I think that maybe, like he, yeah, I mean, it's conceivable that he could come back. But yeah. he is a fan favorite, and that's another like issue that people have with the season is that it's very, it's a lot of fan service, like whatever people want is kind of what they get like more scenes with pod and brawn and people who are not like actually like in the books What's wrong with <laughs> pod? and his magic dick <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, is, like, is, is, is it magic no it's just like remember that like in season two and, i remember that yeah it's like the only distinguishing thing about it is yeah. pudgy like little kid he's, yeah he's cute no yeah. i don't mind them to be they're like comic relief basically in like this terrifying world Bron's um, fucking badass. Yeah, I love Bron. Yeah. He's great. But yeah, it it really depends on what viewers want and um it's totally different from like being a book reader because as a book reader you're like worshiping the author. You're like anything the author says is canon. Like that's just it. But then with TV it's a lot because TV doesn't have it doesn't have like a face. Like it doesn't have a single author, right? It's a billion people working on this project. Yeah. It's a lot easier for a TV viewer to be like, uh, oh, like, I don't really, like, like that. I don't consider that to be, like, part of, like, I'm just going to forget that scene happened or something. Like, it's a lot easier for uh, a TV viewer to kind of um, render or reinterpret something um, than it is for a, a book reader. Because for a book reader, like, the author is God, basically, mm. in that story. Wow. Yeah. Well, you brought up briefly um, the... Uh, summit in the dragon pit yes now that was an interesting scene mm -hmm. um a lot of stuff went on there mm -hmm. what i was struck by was like that nothing apparently went wrong like mm -hmm. like they didn't lash out and just like a battle ensue yeah i know like like it's kind of like it's like in the star wars 
mm-hmm. where like they're all on the Millennium Falcon, like all the main characters <laughs> are on it pretty much, and like okay, we're gonna be fine mm-hmm. because we're on, we're all on like the ship, right? Like they're not gonna kill all the main characters and have it eaten right. by the giant fucking space right. worm, <laughs> and yeah, like Family Guy, like um, made fun of that at one point. That's why it was mm-hmm. really funny when they did that. Mm-hmm. Um, what I liked about the scene was when uh, they unleashed the the, mm-hmm. uh, the white. Yes. And it like ran at Cersei, yeah. and she's like, oh, "Holy what the shit!" Fuck is that? Yeah. And, uh, and then of course Euron Greyjoy. He's is like, great. That terrified me. <laughs> yeah, it's like His okay. Weird Danish accent. Yeah. Whatever. Whatever he has. I didn't really get like at, at the fir- at the first uh, or the um, the outside of the scene mm. when he comes in. Uh, I mean, he doesn't come in. They're all, like, in a courtyard. What am I talking yeah. about? But, like, he... He, he steps forward. He steps forth, yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he's like, if fucking Theon doesn't submit to me, I'm gonna kill Yara or something. Or yeah. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. And, like, what's the point of it? Because cause <laughs> he's trying to... Pro- I think he's trying to provoke... Yeah, he's um, intimidate Provoke Theon, uh, yeah. Theon yeah. and, like, fuck with his head. But there's that thing where I'm like but like it was so oddly placed like <laughs> at, at, the, at the very beginning of, yeah. of the meeting I think that's just Euron's character um he's just he he likes doing things that pe- he knows that people won't like um even his allies <laughs> even he knows that Cersei would be like enraged with him because like this is her summit basically um and he's just like a, a side player but he he just grabs the opportunity to fuck with everyone that's just kind of his character and going back to like the books, that's that's a that's a, a thread in that character that stays within the books. Like he just wants to fuck with everyone, but other than that, they're very different. Yeah. But I, I really like the book, uh, you're, or the sh- sorry, the show you're on because he's very like someone's compared him to Ramsey, but like in like a fun way. He's like that crazy uncle who's just yeah, like, like he, he, he's not diabolical. He seems a lot more gregarious. I think. Yeah, yeah. I think Ramsey is just more like just creepy and evil. Exactly, he has a bit and more charisma. Yeah, yeah. Euron is kind of like this arrogant upstart. Mm-hmm. You know, like he like he sees power mm-hmm. in the Iron Islands, and now he's trying to prove himself. That yeah. kind of thing. He's a very interesting character in the book because he's supposed to be more of a pirate, like like an actually like swashbuckling pirate, and they really play up. So, like, Martin kind of doesn't have a lot of White Walker fantasy, but with Euron, it's a lot more of, like, sort of fantastical stuff because he's supposed to have, like, sh- like um, sailed all over the world and he knows, like, dark magic and dark sorcery and that's how he he reanimates corpses to be on the silence, to work the silence. Or no, I think they're all just mutes. But anyway, he, he knows dark sorcery and stuff. And yeah. He's seen that shit, but in the in the in the show, Euron is a bit more of a human character, um, and also Euron in the show has like an eye patch, and I think like whatever is behind the eye is supposed to be like some like creepy artifact or something. Ooh. Yeah, he's he's a cyn- like a, a sinister character. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's he's very very creepy. So, let's talk about your outlook for the show. <laughs> And it's obvious that a lot of fans are unhappy with the show, mm-hmm. and many still love it. I'm hopeful, and I like I believe quite strongly. Just you know, I don't know. Maybe it's because I want to, <laughs> but I think that the next season is going to be really good. Um, mm-hmm. I feel like they're going to have to bring all of like I mean, the writers going to have to bring all their writing chops. Yeah. You know, into and this, yeah. into plays, yeah, and just you know. Mm-hmm. What do you see coming in terms of overall uh, plot, but more importantly, the characters that we've been with uh, since twenty eleven? Ooh, that's a huge question. Yeah, I'm pretty sure yeah. we can talk about this for like probably forever. forever. But you know, my outlook is very similar to yours. Actually, I think I'm I am very hopeful. Um, like many of the cri- crit- critiques, critics of critics yeah (laughs) critics Critics. i'm not a critique (laughs) a top critique (laughs) yeah Uh, yeah, what like like the uh, many critics of the show i became disillusioned after season four with the show um season six was bad 
Yeah. Oh my god. I'm I'm not even gonna get started. Yeah. We're just gonna pretend none of that dialogue happened, none of those plots, none of those character like fuck ups and one eighties with everyone's desires and motivation. Yeah. Like we're just not gonna <laughs> and the cringe worthy dialogue. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm specifically thinking about Tyrion and Missandei and Grey Worm. That is just awful. Like they just did not know what to do without any of the book material. But anyway, um, I think they've kind of found some fuel left over to do um, season eight after season seven. I feel a little like revitalized in terms of my interest in in the uh, story now because it, they are doing like very interesting things in terms of like flashbacks and. Um, like very cool sort of effects and storytelling so I'm very interested to see what they kind of do with that um, in terms of plots and uh, characters um, I prescribe to the idea that there won't be an Iron Throne at the end that seems quite Ooh. yeah well hold on now yeah we're not gonna yes, gloss over skim that, that over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. explain yeah. okay so, uh, going back to George R. R. Martin's trope, breaking, um, trope, <laughs> <laughs> um, he would not, like, do the same thing as uh, a King Arthur legend, for example, or even Lord of the Rings, where there's still a, a realm to look after and still a sort of uh, a monarchy in place. Um, so again, going back to YouTube uh, critic people who are much better um, thinkers about this than I am, um... Uh, what is it? Game of Thrones Academy. They have talked about how um, this is like a sort of historical progression in terms of real world sort of history. So before they had the monarchy and now they're going to move into a sort of democratic system. Um, so that's kind of what's going to happen. And all the, the sort of younger and more like progressive thinking characters are the people who are going to stay alive like Sam and Sansa and um, uh, who else? Well, Brienne, like all these people who, who don't fit into the normal tropes of knight and noble and um, like fighter and stuff like that, like they're they're the ones who are going to succeed in this new world. And it's sort of, it's, it's, it's going to mimic our sort of medieval to enlightened um, era history, basically. Yeah. So I think that's what it, what's going to happen. Uh, it's probably not going to be a very smooth sort of... Um, transition so I think there is someone who's going to lead everything and that might be Sansa in terms of what the TV show is kind of doing because she seems to be like a very savvy leader um, she she has both the, the sort of morality that Daenerys kind of has in terms of what's best for the people but she's also very like politically like savvy yeah. yeah exactly who, so, who else could it be though besides Sansa besides Sansa um, it can't be any of the main characters um, but maybe it is one of the main characters because Martin wants us to think it won't be the main characters. But why not? Um, basically because it's too easy of an answer. Um, it might happen in the show, to be honest, but in terms of the overall story, it's probably not going to be one of them. And in the books, there are hints that Danny is, is like not the person that she is, uh, she thinks she is basically. Um, and that in, she's going to kind of crazy, basically, like she's becoming oh, yeah, like a okay. mad person. She's and that's also in the in the in the show a little bit as well. But um, yeah, the, she's still not in Westeros in the books in terms of where the books are currently. She's just taking like way too long. It's it's not gonna happen. Um, for Jon Snow, that's another big one. It's just too simple. It's 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 like the Aragorn story where it's this like shadowy sort of character who's very humble and great fighter, great lover, great person who ends up on the throne. He's just and, a good dude. Yeah. <laughs> and like the the show made like its own sort of um like it, it it took it everything to its own hands by making John a legitimate child of Rhaegar Targaryen. Um, which technically can't happen in Westeros, like politically that wouldn't ever happen um, in terms of like annulling marriages and stuff. But yeah, so there would, he, 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 he would only be a bastard of Rhaegar Targaryen and Lyanna Stark. Um, and that, that's why we love him, right? Because he's a bastard, he's a broken thing, he's not fitting to the world that he lives in. Mm -hmm. um, so for him to be like the rightful heir and all that shit, like 
even if he was that, he he can't. Yeah, he can't be the end. Like it is, it is. You know, the thing is, he doesn't. He doesn't have that kind of like mm-hmm. princely quality to him, yeah. like at all. Yeah, that's true. Um, you know, and obviously, again, like this is just me having just uh, seen seen the show, mm-hmm. but like, and the thing is, even Daenerys, like, as time goes on, I feel like she's she's less like queenly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. As in, like, yeah. like I'm like this. Real, she had a lot of that when she, when they were still calling her Khaleesi. I think that yeah. was when like she was probably like the most queenly. Yeah. Um, and like the I don't know the most monarchical. Yes. I don't know what, you, what the what the uh, term region, is. Re, uh, yeah. Well, anyway, yeah. you know what I'm queenly, talking about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah, I think now it's Her like type. she is like I'm a revolutionary leader. Yeah. Yeah. In exactly. this struggle, and um, you know, of course, now we have crazy fucking ice zombies that are going to come and just, <laughs> yeah. you know, be like that wedge that's like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> We're still here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You didn't deal with us yet. Yeah. Yeah. Come well, the, the thing, the thing that I was, um, that I was most worried about was mm-hmm. that there was going to be like this really cheesy and almost like way too predictable, um, uh, development where, the the Lannisters and then Daenerys's camp mm. were like, oh, we have to unite against oh, our yeah. common enemy. Yeah. And you know, then they defeat the White Walkers, and they're like, oh, okay, now we'll just share. But oh, what, <laughs> well, one, I know it would never happen because Cersei is what she is, mm-hmm. <laughs> and Daenerys also is what she is when yeah. it comes to uh, power and yeah. um, the rightful heir kind of. Um, nonsense she doesn't want to share it but i mean i would really hate for it to go where it's just that Mm -hmm. and then it it ends up where like you know they defeat the white walkers together and then they fight each other and then someone just emerges on top yeah it seems like that would just be a really unfortunate kind of um it's too formulaic you know yeah like it's not what the story is you know it would just suck yeah but yeah i think that a lot of i mean or maybe some fans are are worried I mean, like I am, mm-hmm. are worried that because we've already kind of experienced some shoddy like plot development mm-hmm. in like the past couple series that like we're like a little apprehensive of how well we're gonna do it. It's also purely, like there's that that other aspect where we're thinking about ourselves too much. We're like, <laughs> I want my beloved series to end <laughs> all nice and like smart, like not, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. I think we're gonna have to come to grips with the fact that, you know, they're gonna end it however they can end it, mm-hmm. uh, based on like whatever the budget that they have and yeah. what they see fit. And obviously, um, George R. R. Martin is very distant from the show. It appears, mm-hmm. seeing as how he's going on Twitter and talking about the Last Kingdom, yeah. which we will also talk about. Yes, yeah. I forgot. I can't we, 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 f- got, we yeah. forgot that. Yeah, we have to look up the new season as well and yeah. kind of do a recap. Oh my God. So good. What a great show. Yeah. So like George R. R. Martin is just uh, like blast advertising that show instead of his own. <laughs> so that's obviously like a, a hint that he's not very happy about what's happening. People who analyze the the TV show like for for free on YouTube and stuff like if they had been employed by the showrunners to <laughs> write stuff, it would be a much better show. Yeah, let me tell you, everything would crazy get shit. all the details yeah. right. Yeah, all the conspiracies would be true. <laughs> yeah. You know, exactly. um, the um, the the land beyond the wall would actually be connected with Essos. Yeah, I don't think that's a theory. <laughs> Well, it is a theory, but it's, there's a well, strong, strong connection to that because uh, Essos has also had a long night um, in like the easternmost part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, like there, it's a gray waste in that area after E.T., which is the the Asian sort of um, rendition yeah, yeah. of Essos. Um, beyond that, it's a gray waste, so it could like very conceivably be related to the land of yeah. always winter, which is the land beyond the wall. It's crazy. Yeah, and yeah. going back to like the non-formulaicness of the season uh, finale, I like I love Cersei's bits in this like season, uh, the season, and even the the show finale. Oh, she's great. I mean, she, she, she she's getting. It, it, I you know I thought like I didn't really care that much for her mm-hmm. early on in the show, and it's yeah. probably because she wasn't really that important. Yeah. Um. Yeah. She was just a mother. Crazy and even matter. in season six, like I was like, ah, oh, you know, she's she's queen now. She's yeah. Alive. <laughs> she, 
like the way her character has changed is yeah. just like wow. It's like, insane. I, she's, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, and it, it fits her because she's very greedy in very many ways, as stated in the book. And she's gotten to this point where she has everything she wants, basically. Like, she's she has power over, like, officially over Westeros. She's having another child. Um, but she's you still see that she's not happy with anything. She's very angry and very vindictive and sort of, like, off a rocker in terms of, like, not being, yeah, like, think? emotionally intelligent at all. Like, she's just, like, bent on vengeance. She's almost, like, mirroring the mountain, like, her guardian. Mm. And that... He, he, she's just fueled by something inhuman, basically. Like, something that's not, like, kind or empathetic. And that's basically what the mountain is at this point. He's not... He's animated by some dark magic. And it's kind of like what Cersei is in, like, a more political way as opposed to fantastical. Yeah. But, but still, it remains, in the show at least, she spared both Tyrion yes. and Jaime. Yeah. But she could have been Very interesting. Uberated. On that note, we're going to actually tie this up mm -hmm. with a discussion of size. Oh, yes. Because size matters. matters. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, Tyrion Lannister mm -hmm. and the mountain. Who would win? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I don't think, well... Yeah, no, that's not a fair comparison. I don't even think that Tyrion could manipulate the mountain with his words. No. I don't think... Not happened. at this point. No. Well, I mean, I mean, Tyrion enlisted one of the best fighters mm -hmm. from Dorne. And that dude yes. died. Yeah. That was painful to watch. Oh, my God. Auburn Martell. That was, like, probably the last gut-wrenching death in, on the show. Yeah. For me. That was one of the hard. I mean, it was one of the hardest to watch yeah. ever. And the thing was, oh, yeah. is, it was interesting because he wasn't like I didn't get super emotionally invested. Mm. Um, Many did though. <laughs> well, yeah, he was he was beloved. But uh, yeah. I think more. Well, I think it's because like of what happened mm -hmm. to his family and how yeah. how he was like so uh, driven by revenge, like in that last fight. Yeah. And then it just like it completely got to the best of him. Like falls on top of him, and yeah. you know. Yep. Ends up getting his face just, like, crushed like a... Mm -hmm. Watermelon. Yeah. Basically. Yeah, that's the other thing, too. Like, the way the show did it, oh, my God, it was yeah. disgusting. Like, yeah. It was great. <laughs> yeah. It's too bad, but... Yes, size. Size. It's an, it's an interesting, like, topic because mm -hmm. this is, like, one of the only, like, you know... Peter Dinklage is the only, like, little person mm -hmm. actor that I, like, know. Oh, no, yeah. Um, or I've seen really, and, and Warwick Davis from Harry Potter. He plays Professor w uh, Flitwick and the Goblin. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> but but even like as, as far as like fantasy um, shows or or films go, like he's really the only one like of note. Mm -hmm. And then you know, there's the couple that you mentioned that are like minor characters. But he's like Tyrion is a, I mean, at this point, like he's one of my favorite um, characters in the whole mm -hmm. series. Like this drunk that no one understands yeah. sort of thing <laughs> he's so intelligent that like he this no one he can't really relate to anybody right yeah and he just like lets his demons just kind of rule his life mm -hmm. the mountain is just uh he changes from a giant murderous brute yeah into a zombie kind of version of a giant murderous brute yeah um it was neat though because when we watched when we watched the behind the scenes we mm -hmm. saw them doing uh what's the actor's name it's this Icelandic oh, God. Superman. Don't even know. It's like <laughs> yeah. something like that. Something crazy. <laughs> something I measly. I bet it means dude with beard. In, uh, <laughs> in, in like red beard or something. Yeah. yeah. But they were doing his makeup, and it was all like his face was all torn up and zombie mm -hmm. legs. So maybe like we're gonna like, you would brought this up um, outside of uh, off air, off the podcast <laughs> that. Uh, we might get like a facial reveal, and there might be some of that uh, mm -hmm. um, hound and uh, mountain. Oh, clay game bowl. Yeah, that's what they call it. <laughs> <laughs> that's clever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that would be. I mean, that's. I think that kind of has to get resolved because mm -hmm. it's come up so many times in the show where um, the hound's problem or like his fear of fire, mm -hmm. and 
how jaded he is and yeah i mean he, he, he has like this very nihilistic view of like of life and he's and another that. great character but yeah he's so anyway talking about it's... like size yeah like, yeah, yeah okay great. um so i think that's the like size in terms of again george R. R. martin's perspective is very um many fantasy sort of tales so like in lord of the rings one of the big themes is that hobbits can do anything no matter their size kind of thing. And that's kind of, it's, it's, you can see that in um, Song of Ice and Fire as well in terms of like how powerful Tyrion can be. Are you calling Tyrion a hobbit? Yeah, he's a little hobbit. <laughs> <laughs> well, like just small in stature in general. It doesn't really matter um, how they get to the be that, even if it's metaphorical or physical. Um, basically, the underdog is always um, going to find some sort of relief at some point um it doesn't have to be at the end but they'll um in terms of fantasy like that's what we as readers like to read is like and that's what we empathize with is that these characters don't have something like they're not part of the the absolute elite in terms of like power stature anything and that's kind of why we yeah uh, like them Tyrion has that that great line where he's like, "Oh, I'm in. I like. I have a soft spot for cripples, bastards, and broken things." And that's basically <laughs> all of fantasy is yeah. that there's always an underdog, like a farmer or something, who like goes to become a knight after slaying a dragon or something. Yeah, it's that's, that's a very uh, fantasy kind of trope, and I don't think Martin uh, veers away from that too much. Like Tyrion might not end up on the Iron Throne at all, but he's still like you can see his his struggles with the. Uh, power and and it's interesting then that the mountain doesn't speak anymore yeah and he's just this lumbering man like this creepy kind of menacing, menacing. like brute like you know it can just mm -hmm. like crush you yeah um so yeah it's just it's that's a, a brilliant point there oh well i try <laughs> <laughs> you literary analyst yeah. you i got a gold star for that one yeah i yeah. think so you get an a plus on your essay yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that that's a great point that um and also like going back to the fact that he's a more fantastical creature now, uh the mountain. Um he's literally like the 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 dark horse in well not the dark horse, but like a literal dark horse in the political sort of sphere where he's he's not anything that anyone can really deal with. Like whenever he he walks in front of you like everyone like just steps away because he's just terrifying and it's not just because of his size anymore it's because of some dark thing imbued into him um so he's he he represents a sort of like fantastical like terrible greed and sort of like a political sphere um it could be again another sort of metaphor for um like nuclear code co not the codes but the actual weapons but also like a person's sort of dark desire for actually wanting to press like the button to release um new like weapons of mass destruction onto people like he represents that sort of darker side of politics basically i think um and Tyrion, like he's obviously not like the the greatest guy in the world he killed his father he's done a bunch of like crazy shit um but he he represents a sort of different sort of side of politics and all that kind of stuff but yeah he he has a different sort of power that Varys touches on which is that um he has influence and he has a shadow that can um, be larger than his own body because of his mind and his charisma on that note i think that's all that we have for mm -hmm. this afternoon yes thanks for listening and see you next time